But today we, we need to talk about what is a protocol, what is a protocol architecture, and, and today and tomorrow get on to the internet. Last week we, what did we do last week? Very basic introduction to data communications, some of the terminology and concepts. How do you introduce yourself in Thailand? And what motion do you do when you meet someone? Why? Smile, more formal. So, as well, I've, I've been here for almost well, five or six years, and there's still some parts of that greeting, the why, that I don't understand. If you want to explain to someone what you do when you meet someone, so I'm here and someone walks into the room, what do I do to greet them? How would you explain that? What do I do to why someone? What do I do? What are the rules that you follow or I should follow if someone walks into the room and I want to greet them? Come on, there's a new person come to the country, you want to explain them the culture and the, the, uh, 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 the etiquette of how do you why someone? What do I do? Tell me what I should do. Smile, but let's focus on the, the Thai form, the, the why. If I pronounce it correctly, yes. What do I do? Describe it to me. Put your hands together and put your hands together and bow your head like this. Is that right? Put it around your chest and bow your head. Okay, so that's something about the placement of the hands and what you do as a motion. Okay, and that has some meaning, correct? That is where you where you place your hands and how much you bow your head has some meaning. If I do this, it probably means something then different than this, correct? That has a different meaning. So this is a form of communication where the placement of the hands and how much you bow your head has a different meaning. We will consider that as a message. There are two different, or there are different types of messages depend upon where you place your hands and how much you bow. When do I do this? When do I do it? I'm on my own in the room and someone walks in. When do I initiate this greeting? After a young, after someone younger than me does it to me, correct? That's the only time I do it. And when someone's older, what do I do? I, this is confusing. Write it down. Let me write it down. First, uh, let me make some notes. The different types that we may have, the different levels. I put my hands together. Sorry, you can't see that, I can. I put my hands together, raise, let's say, to my forehead, and do a deep bow. Okay? That's one type. Another type, put my hands together, raise to maybe my nose, and a small bow. Different meaning to the recipient depending upon where my hands are and how much I bend over or bow my head. Any others? Of course, they variations. Sometimes I receive this one. Someone's got the handful, they just put up one hand and just a little bit like that. Okay, so that has a different meaning as well, or a different occasion that it's used. They are the types of messages that are used to communicate. When do I do it? And you've just mentioned, let's say I'm, 
I'm doing nothing. I'm standing in the room, I'm idle, I'm doing nothing, and there were two cases. If someone who's younger than me walked into the room, or I was greeting a younger person, or if someone's older. So let's write that down. If person arrives, or let's say if junior person arrives, that is, if someone younger than me arrives in the room, what do I do? What do I do? You are all younger than me, you walk into the room, what do I do? I don't have to bow, uh, but what do I do first? I usually would wait for you to do something, correct? It, it's for you to initiate, the younger person to initiate. So I may wait for some response. So I'll wait from you to initiate some communications. All right. All right. If an older person walks into a room, arrives, what do I do? Then I perform my action. And then what? And after I do it to them, what do, what do I do? Receive one back, hopefully. It's usually a two-way communication, so I may wait for a response. Okay, so there's the two cases. Let's consider, okay, that was when I'm idle at the starting stage. What if I'm waiting? If I'm waiting, then what may happen? then I may receive from a younger person, a junior person, wise to me. What do I do? If a junior person, I respond back. So that that covers the first case. If a junior person arrives, from my perspective, I just wait until they why me and I return the greeting. And after that, we've finished this greeting, correct? Now we can start talking or, or whatever we want to do. Okay. Start walking, start talking. Okay, that's finished that greeting or the rules for the greeting in that case. What if it was a senior person? In this case, what do I do? What do I do? Initially, I was in the room a senior person arrives, I initiate the greeting, I why, then I wait, and then the senior person responds, then really we've finished the communication or the greeting part of it, and then we can start our data communications or start talking, for example. So that completes our greeting in that case. So that what I'm trying to do here is describe the rules for how we greet someone. Any other cases? What about this scenario? Uh, I'm waiting. A junior person has walked in. I'm waiting. What if they never return, or what if they never initiate with a Y to me? What do I do? I do nothing. Let it pass. Maybe I'm a not very nice person. Maybe I'll ignore you if you do that. So yes, the response will, may differ in that case. You may start talking, or maybe you just ignore that person. Okay, so that depends upon the scenario. And similar, if you wait too long for a senior person, that is you have given a why to them, and you're waiting for a response, what do you do? If they don't respond, 
Maybe you will not ignore them. Maybe you'll start talking. But why did they not respond? Maybe I'm a little bit nervous why they didn't respond to me and uh, I may be careful what I say. Okay, that depends upon the scenario of the person. But what we're showing here is that we can describe that greeting as a set of rules. What if the person walks into the room and I don't know if they're junior or senior? There's another case, okay? We need to consider that. We would need to just, if we want to be precise here, we'd need to consider uh, other possible cases here, but a, a simple start. This is a protocol where a protocol can be described by two things. A set of rules describing what you do, that's this part, and a set of messages and the syntax of those messages that are exchanged between the entities communicating. So that's the start. In my case, my simple case, I have three types of messages and they have different or slightly different meanings. And I have a set of rules for what I should do to communicate. And I've described those rules using two different states. So I say that I can be in two states. I'm either idle or I'm waiting. If I'm idle, some events can happen. Either a person, so a person arrives, that's an event. There may be a condition such that that person is younger than me or older than me. Depending upon that condition, I take different actions. Take an action and enter a new state. And in that state, again, some events may happen. Someone wise or after I've given them a why, I start my timer, my stopwatch, and I'm waiting for three seconds, five seconds, ten seconds, they haven't responded, and therefore I may take one of these actions. So a protocol, we can think of it as a set of states that we're in, or the entity is in, some actions, or some events that may occur, some actions are taken, and including those actions, maybe some timer expires. This is one for human communication. What we need to, what we're going to look at this semester is protocols for computer communication. So how does my laptop initiate communications with this PC? So it, I want to transfer some data. There may be a protocol to perform some handshake with the PC to initiate communications, agree upon some uh, parameters. And that could be described in a similar manner a set of messages that my laptop can send and receive, the exact syntax of those messages, the exact format of them, and a set of rules or procedures that my laptop must follow. My laptop is not as smart as me, or as a laptop or a computer needs to be programmed, it will only do what it is programmed to do. So in protocols for computers, we need to be very precise when we describe this. If I tell my computer, if you wait too long, then it, respond with this, I must also tell my computer how long it must wait. What is too long? So for a computer protocol, we need to define this more precisely than what I've done here. But the same concept. This is a protocol. We need to, now that we know what a protocol is, we need to see how they are used for data communications. We've said this, a protocol, a set of rules that two or more peer entities obey in order to communicate. Two or more. Often we'll think of two, two entities communicating, me with another person one computer with another computer. But in general, it may be multiple entities. It may be three, four, five entities communicating. The entity, entities are the software or hardware in the computer. Made up of two parts, the syntax or the format of the messages and the rules or procedures that must be followed, including timing information. How long do you wait before you take some action and so on? So we've seen that. What is a protocol? We 
we want to say what a protocol architecture is. And to look at that, we need to say why we need a protocol architecture. My computer wants to communicate with this PC. We mentioned last week communications, data communications is very complex. There are many things that need to happen to accurately deliver the data in a timely manner from my computer to the PC. Communications is complex, many different tasks. What we do in data communications is apply the divide and conquer principle. Because it's very complex, because there are many different tasks, instead of creating one protocol that does everything, we, have, we take our problem of data communications, break it into many different subtasks, many different smaller problems, and create protocols for each of those subtasks. And together, they provide communications across a network. That's divide and conquer. Same when you write a piece of software. You don't put all, your, all of your code in the main function. Okay? You break it into sub-functions or classes, whatever methodology you're using. You, divide the problem that you're trying to solve into many smaller problems and then implement solutions for those smaller problems. We do that with protocols as well. The terminology we use in data communications when we divide the problem into sub-problems, we refer to those groups of sub-problems as layers. And we arrange layers in some stack, one on top of the other. And that stack of layers is referred to as a protocol architecture or a protocol stack. And what we'll do today mainly is give an example of a protocol architecture and then look at a real protocol architecture and try to introduce these concepts. And from today to the rest of the, for the rest of the semester, we will go through a real protocol architecture. Let's go forward to give you an example. Here's a protocol stack, or a picture of a protocol stack or a protocol architecture. We divide tasks, or we categorize tasks. In this example, we've categorized tasks into three groups. We've called one group applications, one group transport, and another group network access. And these are names of layers. The bottom layer, network access layer, the transport layer, and the application layer at the top. So a protocol architecture is a combination of multiple layers, one on top of the other, where each layer implements protocols to perform some tasks. So we'd have protocols which are in this group, the network access group. We'd have other protocols performing different tasks in the transport group or the transport layer. And other protocols performing tasks related to applications in the application layer. That's all we mean by a protocol stack or protocol architecture. This is just an example one that we'll use. We'll go through a real one shortly. Uh, what do we miss? And we implement a protocol stack inside, say, a computer. My laptop implements a particular protocol stack or protocol architecture. That is the software in the applications, the software in the operating system, and the hardware all implement a set of protocols where the, each protocol belongs to some layer. So it's implemented inside your computer. Why do we do this? Having layers or, or this division of functionality into layers helps with uh, creating standards that people will agree upon and use. It helps with um, commercializing things. That is, we'll see later that I can buy a wireless LAN card that will work in that computer and it will be able to communicate with a wireless LAN card in another computer from a different manufacturer. 
And the reason that they can talk between each other, between different manufacturers of different devices, so different hardware, is because they follow some standard and that that standard is implemented in a particular layer. So there's some uh, benefits of using this layered view of protocols. Let's go through a simple architecture and try and explain some concepts. This is an example, not a real architecture. Let's say we want to communicate between some computers. So what do we have? We have applications that users use. You and I use applications. Those applications run, on, run as software on some computers. My laptop, the PC, some other computers. They have some applications on them, usually more than one application. I have a web browser application, an email, instant messaging, a file download application, different applications running on my computer. And I have some network that connects computers together. Where, where are they? For example, the network may consist of my computer, a cable plugged into the computer, a LAN cable for example, plugged into my laptop, and the other end plugged into some special network device, a switch or a hub. Okay? So that's the network part of it, the cables and the network devices. For this example, let's break the tasks for communications into three different groups. Some tasks are specific to applications. The tasks that my web browser does are different to the tasks that my instant messaging application, MSN or whatever chat application you have does. They need to do different things in terms of communications. My web browser needs to be able to request a web page and receive a web page from a server. My instant messaging application needs to be able to create a short message and send that and receive from some other client, some other instant messaging application. So different applications have different tasks to complete. We'll put all the protocols related to those applications in the application layer. Everything that's specific to an application will group it into this application layer. At the bottom, my computer needs to somehow access the network. Here's my computer. It needs to connect to the network. For example, my laptop needs to, or my PC, this is a, a LAN card, it may be in the back of the PC or it's on board the motherboard in most computers now. So when I plug in my cable, what are the protocols to get this LAN card to send signals across this cable, to send data across the cable? That's what we call, or in this example, we're going to say is part of the network access layer. All the things about sending signals across cables or wirelessly, what, whatever, uh, what the hardware needs to do, addressing and so on, will group into the network access layer. So we'll have a set of protocols that provide my computer access to a network, allow me to send data through the network. Some protocols for applications, some for accessing the network. What's this middle one for? Some applications have some common features. Let's list some example applications. Let's say web browsing is an application. Email, instant messaging, and some file download or file transfer. Example applications. Where's my pen? They do different things. This one needs to be able to, when you type in a URL or click on a link, it needs to be able to send a request for a web page to a server, receive that response. And the formats of that request and response it receives uh, must be defined. Email needs to be able to allow you to type in, compose an email, 
and structure that email to be sent to an email server. Instant messaging needs to be able to allow you to compose some short message, click send, send it to someone else's computer, get updates of their status, whether they're online, offline, busy, and so on, different features of instant messaging and so on. Those features, we'd say, are implemented by application layer protocols inside the application layer. But they all have some common features. One of them is, let's say, data reliability. <coughs> Remember back to last week, we said three metrics, delivery, accuracy, timeliness. Accuracy. A web server sends me a web page. The page that I receive must be the same as what was on the web server. We need it to be 100% accurate to be effective. Same as we used the example last week, you send someone an email, the email they receive must be the same as what you sent. If not, it's ineffective. Same with instant messaging and even file transfer. You download a 10 gigabyte file, the file on the server and the file that you receive must be the same sequence of bits. All of these need data reliability. That is, if I access a web server across the internet and somewhere in the network there's an error, something goes wrong, we need to somehow fix that. Otherwise, I won't receive the file correctly or the, the data correctly. So one mechanism that's common to these applications is data reliability. If something goes wrong, fix it. That's what I mean. Because it's common to many applications, rather than implementing this feature in each application, we'll implement it in its own independent application in the transport layer, in, say, a transport protocol. So in our example, the role of the transport layer is to provide reliability, with the idea that my web browsing application, instead of implementing its own reliability mechanisms, uses that of the transport protocol. My email application, instead of implementing its own reliability, just uses that of the same transport protocol, and so on. So we have one protocol for reliably sending data across the internet, across our network. Many applications make use of that one protocol. So it's rather than duplicating features across many protocols, we create one separate protocol that does it on behalf of other features. That's the idea. There's my pen drawn. So, in our example protocol architecture, architecture, we have a stack with three layers. Application, transport, network access. Each of our computers, three computers in this example, implement each of those layers. Computer A, B, and C. When I say implement, there's some software on this computer that implements the protocols for applications and transport, and maybe some software and even hardware, some of, it, of the network access maybe on hardware in the LAN card, for example. And that's the same in each computer. Applications specific to one of our example applications. Transport, general for all applications sends data across the network. Network access allows us to send across a link to access the network. What is this cloud communication networks? Maybe it's just this device. That is, this is a switch. One computer has a cable coming out. It plugs into this switch. Computer B and C also plug into this switch. That connects those three computers together. Or it could be multiple switches, or it can be very complex. We haven't shown the detail. But some way for those three computers to connect to each other. How do we communicate? What's next? Here's, if we focus on two computers, A and B. A wants to send some data to B. 
we communicate through the layers inside a computer. That is, from the top layer, we create some data. We may process that data, send it to the next layer. That will follow its rules. Remember, a protocol is a set of rules for how to do something. The next layer follows some rules, processes the data, sends it to the next layer until we get to the bottom. Then that bottom layer transmits our message across the network. And if everything works correctly, that message should reach the destination. And when it reaches the destination, the bottommost layer processes it according to the rules of the protocol, takes the data, sends it to the next layer, processes, sends the data to the next layer until we reach the top and we've received the data at the intended destination. So in this example with three layers, let's say my web browsing application creates some data, sends it to the transport layer, it does something with it, I'll explain in a moment what it does, sends it to the network access layer, does some processing, transmits, now it goes out of my computer across so it comes out of my computer, so out of the LAN card, across the cable. There's some signal, for example, some electrical signal, and it goes through the network, magically comes through the network, and arrives at computer B. Computer B takes what's received, processes, sends some of it to the transport layer, processes, sends up to the application layer, and the web server application takes the data and does what a web server should do, whatever that is. What I'm trying to do now is not to explain specific protocols, but just give you an idea of the relationship between layers in a protocol stack. That we work in an ordered manner. We send data down through the layers inside a computer, across a network, and then at the receiving computer, up through the layers until we receive the data at the intended destination. Where's, there's some extra information on here. What does it mean? Here's my computer. I'm running many applications. Web, email, instant messaging, file transfer. That's computer A. Here's computer B. It's also running multiple applications, a web server, email. I want to send data from this application on my computer to the corresponding web application on computer B. That's my goal. Running multiple, applica uh, multiple applications. I create some data in my source application. Whatever the web browser creates, it creates some data. Sends that to the transport layer. The transport layer, or the transport protocol, has the role of making sure that data will be sent reliably across our network. One thing it does, it adds some extra information to that data. In this case, it shows it adds a from address and a to address. It indicates which application does this data come from. Application 1 on my computer. And who is it going to? Maybe it would be better if I did it like this. Application 2 on computer B. So not only do we send the data, but we send addresses to indicate the source and destination of that data. In this case, the addresses of the applications. My web browser is application 1. The web server on computer B is application 2. How did I know, know that? That's some extra complexity, which we won't cover until later. But importantly, we don't just send data. 
we send some extra information as well that helps the protocol operate correctly. Transport layer does some processing, sends all of that, the from address, the to address, and the data to the network access layer. This protocol does some processing, adds two more addresses. It adds the addresses of the computers that it's coming from and going to. It's coming from computer A and going to computer B. So let's add some extra information from A to B. The network access layer then transmits all of that across its link. Some magic signal is sent across the link, goes through the network, and is received by the computer B at the network access layer. How does it get across the network and link? Well, we have several topics on that. For now, it's magic. Computer B receives this message. It looks at the addresses. OK, it's from A, it's to B. It recognises, OK, I am B, I am computer B, this is to me. Therefore, it takes some action. And this is some of the rules, same as we described the rules for greeting. We have a rule, if we receive this message, we perform these actions. If I receive a message which is to me, then what I do, remove those from and to addresses, I don't need them anymore. Take what's inside, the grey boxes, and send them to the higher layer, the transport protocol. And then the transport protocol goes to work and does its processing. And then recognises, OK, this data inside here needs to go to application number two sends the data to application number two at computer B, the web application. And the web application receives the data and does what it needs to do. What we've introduced here is how we structure the information we send through layers and across the networks. Formally, these are, recall, are called protocol data units, or PDUs. Informally and more commonly, I think, they call packets. We send packets across the network, where a packet normally contains some data plus some extra control information, usually called headers. Data plus header, where the header may contain addresses, it may contain other things as well. And that's summarised here. Protocols send data. They, that data, headers are added to that data. That process of adding a header to data is called encapsulation. The header may include addresses, for example. It may include other things, sequence numbers and many other things related to the protocol. Formally, the header plus data is called a protocol data unit. We'll normally call them a packet. We'll see some other names as well, but a packet is commonly used. Some things like a message, a frame, a segment, even a datagram are the other names that we'll come across through this semester. Ignore segmentation for now, we'll come to that later. So, what, what you need to gain from this discussion so far, did I just squish something? What you need to gain, okay, to solve communication tasks, we treat those tasks, or we separate those tasks into layers, where layers are responsible for certain tasks. Protocols are implemented in each of the layers. You know what a protocol is. It's a set of rules that we follow including the, the messages or the message formats. So protocols are implemented in layers. Layers have different responsibilities or different tasks. And in terms of the flow of data through a computer, we look at it from a layered perspective. Data starts at the top, 
goes down through the layers, sent out onto the network, received, and then goes up through the layers. We don't just send data. We add some extra useful information, often called headers. A header plus the data is referred to as a packet or a protocol data unit or sometimes one of these four. That's the introduction to protocol architectures. Now we'll go through a real protocol architecture, or at least start on it. And the rest of this semester, we're going to go through this real protocol architecture, going through all the layers. So even if some of the discussion so far doesn't make sense or you don't know why that's the case, by the end of the semester you should know that. The protocol architecture we're going to go through is called TCP IP, or the Internet Protocol Architecture. Where did the internet come from? Who created the internet? Well, in the US in the 1960s, some of the universities wanted to connect their large computers together, okay? You imagine back 40, 50 years ago, we didn't have laptops and PCs, but have large mainframe computers. Universities normally have them because they could afford them and use them for research. And it's a benefit to connect them together, say connect three universities together and share their computing resources. So the Advanced Research Projects Agency, I think it stands for, ARPA, which eventually become part of the, the Department of Defense in the US, funded some research to connect the university and some other organization computers together okay, across the US. So they formed a network amongst these computers in the US, became ARPANET. And ARPANET, to communicate between these computers in the unis, two key protocols were used. One was called IP, the Internet Protocol. Okay. The other one was called TCP, the Transmission Control Protocol. There were others as well, but they were the two main ones. So that network used TCP and IP as protocols, they were the names of protocols, and became referred to the set of pro protocols as the TCP IP slash IP protocol, protocol architecture, protocol stack, protocol suite of proto protocols, but commonly referred to as TCP TCP IP. This ARPANET was expanded. More universities in the US. In other countries, they were building their own networks. And eventually, they started to use the same protocols, TCP and IP, so that they could connect between the universities in the US to the universities in Europe and in Asia and so on and connected and keep connecting together, not just universities, but now companies, internet service providers, end users like you and I, and that's where we get to today, the internet. So we can say that the internet came from this research network in the US, ARPANET. Now, there are some organizations that manage the protocols used in the internet. TCP and IP were developed 40 to 50 years ago. So they're quite old in terms of computer technology, but still used today. But they've been improved over time. And there have been new protocols added that are useful. And a lot of that development, improvement, and new protocols is done under what's called the Internet Architecture Board and within that, the Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF. We'll see that referred to through the courts. Just an organization that creates new protocols or new standards for protocols. The protocols are arranged in some layered manner in a protocol architecture. But there's no formal definition of how many layers and what the names of the layers are. In this course, we're going to use a five-layer protocol stack. 
and it's perhaps the most common. Here it is. We have five layers in this protocol architecture. Physical layer deals with getting bits across a link. Coming back to our, our transmitting device, the hardware inside your computer and the cable, if we pass around the cables, have a look at the endpoints. Have a look at the endpoints on the cables. You can also have a look at the LAN cards, but less interesting. Note the Note that this cable has multiple wires in it. It's not just one wire going through that cable. There are, in fact, multiple wires inside. This is just a switch. We'll explain in a moment. That, those cables we're passing around have eight different wires inside. You can see there's some color-coded uh, cabling there. Inside them is copper wiring, so it's copper. So the uh, copper is arranged in a manner in that every pair of those copper wires is twisted around each other for interference or to avoid interference. We'll cover that later. We get what's called twisted pair of copper wires. We transmit data across those wires by taking our bits, zeros and ones, and transmitting some electrical signal we send electricity across the copper such that the shape of that electrical signal is uh, so that the receiver can interpret what bits it represents. A very simple example is you send a high signal to represent bit 1, you send some low signal to represent bit 0. If the receiver receives a high signal, they know a bit 1 was sent. If they receive a low signal, they know a bit 0 was received was sent. So that's how we can simply send data. The physical layer has the responsibility of doing that transmission of signals. It takes as input bits, zeros and ones, and produces some signals that it sends across the link. And at the receiving computer, the physical layer receives signals and converts back to bits, zeros and ones. So that's the simplest definition of the physical layer. I think there may be a later slide that shows this better. But the main goal of the physical layer, take some sequence of bits as input, where those bits represent the data, transmit that data as some signal, some electromagnetic signal. It may not be bits, it uh, could be analog data as well. The very basics of communications, transmitting signals. That's the physical layer. Some examples of technologies at the physical layer, the cables I'm passing around are referred to as twisted pair. They're LAN cables to connect computers together. Your telephone, if you have a telephone at home, a wired telephone, uses twisted pair cabling, the same type of cabling uh, to send the telephone signal. Optical fiber, another example, a different technology. Satellite, other wireless technologies we think of at the physical layer. How do we send signals to a satellite up in space. That's the role of the physical layer or the physical layer protocols to do that. We send some bits represented by a signal across a link. Unfortunately, in real life, things go wrong. There may be errors. I send a sequence of bits. What's received is different from what was sent. One role of the data link layer is to fix those errors. 
I send a sequence of bits from my laptop to the wireless LAN access point on the wall. Okay? I transmit some signal, some radio signal, received by the access point. If the access point can recognize if there are any errors, if it can detect errors, then it could say, OK, what you just sent me is wrong. Please send again. And my laptop sends the same data again. The access point recognizes, OK, this time we've been OK. It's correct. Everything's fine. That's part of the data link layer. Make sure that the data sent across the link is delivered accurately. Some technologies that have protocols at data link and physical layer, Ethernet, wireless LAN, and others. Importantly, these two layers are focusing on the link level communications from one device to another. Which layers are link level? Which layers are link level communications? Physical and data link. Okay. Once we move to the next layer, we'll see it's more than just a link. Sending signals across a link, making sure those, that data sent across the link is delivered correctly. I want to send from my laptop to a server in the US. I have one link to the access point on the wall. And then the access point has another link to a device downstairs, a switch, like the one that's been passed around, but bigger. And then that switch connects to another device or, and another device, eventually to the US. The network layer deals with getting data across that set of links, across a network. The main protocol used in the network layer today is called IP, the internet protocol. How do we get data across the internet? We use the internet protocol across a set of links, across a network of links. The bottom two focus on individual links. The network is about getting data across a set of links. Application is the same as what we spoke about in our previous example. Different protocols for different applications. There's a protocol for web browsing. Those that got eight out of eight in the quiz would know it's HTTP. There's a protocol for file downloads, FTP. Another one for connecting to another computer. You did it to get your password. You used SSH to connect to a remote computer. And hundreds of others, not shown here. What's the transport protocol do? Same as in our previous example where we had three layers, the transport protocol provides mainly reliability mechanisms for all the applications. Instead of having to implement reliability in my web protocol, my email protocol, and my instant messaging protocol, instead it's implemented in just one location, in the transport protocol, as part of the transport layer. It has some other roles as well, but that's the main one we'll see. You need to memorize this, basically. These five layers, the names, the ordering, and over the next week or so, you need to also know what their tasks are. What task belongs to what layer? We'll see some examples uh, all through the semester. But over the next few weeks, you will need to know the task belonging to each layer. In some material, different textbooks, different websites, there may be different names. Maybe this one's called the internet layer, not the network layer. This is maybe the more common stack, but sometimes there's different names. Or this is called the hardware layer, or the LAN layer. In some cases, there may be less than five layers. Four, or there may be even six layers. But I think this is the more common that you will see in the literature. And we'll use that through the course. We're going reasonably fast through protocol architectures. As I said, this course, 
we're going to go from the next topic onwards looking at technologies in each layer moving up. We'll start at the physical layer next, probably next week. Then we'll look at the data link layer, the network layer, transport, and just before the final exam, applications. At the end of the semester, you'll know the different layers, examples of different protocols in each layer, and the relationship between those layers. Before we won't move on to now, we'll move on to that uh, tomorrow, the next slide. But we have something we missed last week. What do we miss? The last slide from last week. You'll see a URL in the last slide from last week. In the last 10 minutes, we'll look at that website. In the last slide of last week, there's a URL to some website. It's on that website, which is here. There's a map of the internet in Thailand. Okay, I'm going to look at that map. I've downloaded it. There's other statistics about internet usage in Thailand. But the map, when you click on this link, there are in fact two different maps. We'll look at them now. This is something you should look at in your own time, mainly because it's very hard to show clearly on the, on the slides. Uh, where are we? Two different maps. These are showing the connectivity of the internet service providers inside Thailand. If I ask a quiz question, can you answer? We cannot even see it. We'll zoom in in a moment. Let's just explain the general structure and then I'll zoom in on some parts so you can see it. The red or pinkish ones, these show what's called national internet exchanges. You'll s surely you'll see an IX, an internet exchange. Inside Thailand, there's some large telecom companies, CAT, Jasmine or Jaztel, True, TOT, CSL, uh, ADAC. And so these are large telecom companies in Thailand that connect all the different internet service providers together. So when you get internet access, you pay an ISP. Okay? Maybe from home, if you've got ADSL, you pay an ISP 600 baht a month and they give you via your telephone line some internet access. You connect from your home into that ISP's network. The ISP's, the internet service provider in Thailand, are these blue ones on the edge. They will see the names of some internet service providers inside the country. To communicate from one ISP to another, they need to connect somehow via a network. To get data from my ISP to your ISP, those two internet service providers need a connection. Rather than the ISPs connecting to every other ISP, there's what, about 30 ISPs here, rather than everyone having a connection to every other, they connect to, co to common internet exchanges. So you can see all the lines which represent connections from internet service providers to the internet exchanges. That's the structure here. Let's zoom in. Possibly. If my screen will come back, it's very slow. My computer's dying. We're getting closer. Maybe you can start reading some of this now. So these are the ISPs that you and I may subscribe to, uh, the companies or the, the uh, departments within larger companies. For example, I subscribe to TOT. 
I pay them for internet access. From my home to their office or their network connection, I have a link via the telephone cable. So I have a connection into this blue TOT ISP. If you are subscribing to a different ISP, let's say PACnet here, some other small ISP, you connect into their network. I want to send something to your computer. So I send it from my computer to my local ISP, Internet Service Provider, TOT. Then they have a connection to the destination ISP via an internet exchange. We can follow, here we have a 21.99 gigabit per second link from TOT into the CAT internet exchange. And then from the internet exchange, there's a 7 gigabit per second link to PACnet. So my data from me to you goes via TOT to the internet exchange to your ISP and then to your computer. So, and we see that ISPs have links to, may have links to multiple internet exchanges for redundancy, for performance, for uh, commercial reasons. You can see the different speeds ranging from say up to 100 gigabits per second for some links down to megabits per second, 90 megabits per second here, depending upon the technology. And you can see the different, well, if you scroll across, eventually you'll see the different internet exchanges, CAT, TOT, Jasmine, and so on. So that's the connectivity within the country. These, these links don't necessarily mean a cable. They may be a network, maybe wireless even, a satellite link. It shows connectivity and the speed of that. Uh, link in, in bits per second. What if I want to connect to someone in another country? This is the second map. It's the international map. It's in fact the links from Thailand to other countries. What we have in the middle, the blue ones, we see CAT again, ADC, Jasmine, True, TOT. These are what's called international internet gateways. They're gateways from Thailand to other countries. Connections from inside to outside. The grey boxes around the edge are internet service providers in other countries. Zoom in. CAT has the largest international gateway. Many different countries connect into their gateway. So when I connect from my local ISP, my data goes to my local ISP to one of these international gateways and then from one of these links to some ISP in another country. We see some examples in Hong Kong, in Indonesia, in Korea, in Malaysia, France and all along the bottom there are others. And you may recognize some of those names. And once it reaches Hong Kong, then it goes inside their network, inside the country, possibly onto another country, depending on the destination. So we see that CAT has links to many different overseas companies. And again, we see the speed. To Korea, 1.2 gigabits, and so on. The last thing you'll see there, which names do you recognize on the overseas ones? Who do you recognize on the gray ones? What names do you recognize? Google. Google is not an ISP. Google is a content provider. And you'll see Google, iMeme up the top, you'll see Microsoft, Yahoo and others. They have direct connections in, into Thailand. So Google in Singapore and Malaysia 
When I access the Google website, or YouTube, which is owned by Google, instead of going to the US, and instead of going via a, a internet service provider, it goes to the international gateway and then direct into Google's network. It's cheaper for them. They don't have to pay another ISP to transport their traffic. And it's faster for me because they have high-speed links into the country. Again, hard to view on the screen. You should spend uh, some time over the next week having a look at these maps and see some of the other details that you can recognize in there. Just an example of the connectivity of the internet inside Thailand. Out of time for today. Tomorrow we'll continue with protocols and protocol architectures.